Now, if you take out your message notes, I want us to look this weekend as we continue in the series on Daring Faith, the Key to Miracles, at daring to give my best to God. The Bible tells us that history is moving toward a climax. History is not circular, it is linear. We are moving to a focus. There was a beginning and there will be an end of history. Scientists used to think, for instance, that the universe was eternal, that it always had been here and always will be here. We know that is not true anymore. Scientists have proven this is not true, that the universe had a definite beginning and that it is actually winding down. We don't know how long it's gonna last, but that it's actually going to have an end at some point. The universe will. And now, I don't care if you call the, the beginning of the universe the Big Bang, I don't have a problem with that, because wherever you have a Big Bang, you've gotta have a Big Banger. <laughs> Somebody had to set it off. Uh, but there was a beginning to history, and the Bible says there will be an end to history, and there will actually be an end to, to Earth. And, and, and the Bible says one day Jesus Christ is going to come back a second time and end the history on earth. Now many people don't realize that in the Bible there are more verses about Jesus' second coming than there are about his first 2,000 years ago at Bethlehem at the first Christmas. Yeah, there are more scriptures in the Bible about Jesus' second coming than there are about his first coming to die on the cross. When he comes back, he's gonna end history. He's going to take those who are still alive at the time uh, with him to join the rest of us who are already in heaven, and he will give out rewards, and, and we begin phase two, which is eternity. What we're gonna do for eternity. Now, should the fact that the Bible says nothing on this planet is gonna last, nothing is gonna last, should that have any impact on how you live your daily life? Well, yeah, yes, it, it should. In fact, here's what the Bible says. Look up here on the screen. 2 Peter 3, 11 and 12 says this. Since everything on earth will be gone one day, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God, because that's what's gonna last, as you wait for the day of God. What is the day of God? The day of God is a term for the second coming of Jesus Christ. As you wait for the day of God and you do your best to make it come soon. You do your best to make, how do I make the second coming of Jesus come sooner? How in the world do I do that? Well, the Bible tells us by telling other people the good news. Because the only reason Jesus Christ hasn't come back yet is he's waiting for the last people that he knows are gonna join his family to join. He's waiting for the last person to hear the opportunity to have the chance of receiving the good news. Once the last person has accepted Christ that God knows is gonna accept him, bam, it's over and we're out of here. So every time you share your faith with somebody, it actually makes that day or that event come sooner. Now it says, do your best. That was an interesting phrase in that verse. And so this week I went and I studied every time the phrase, do your best, is used in the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, I studied every passage that talked about doing your best, because that's a mark of faith. And uh, I don't have time to go into all of it, but let me just summarize it. The Bible tells us that we are to choose the best. The Bible says we are to look for the best in other people. The Bible says we are to think the best. The Bible says we are to give our best. The Bible says we are to do the best we can for God and for good. Let me just show you a couple verses. They're on your outline. First Peter chapter one says this. Do your best, why don't you circle that? Do your best to improve your faith. That's the whole reason we're doing Daring Faith campaign right now, to help improve your faith. Do your best to improve your faith. And you can do this by adding goodness and understanding and self-control and patience and devotion to God and concern for others and love. If you keep growing in this way, it will show that Christ has made your lives useful and meaningful. And I told you last week, this is my goal for your life as your pastor. I want your life to be useful and I want your life to be meaningful. And if, if that happens, I'll die a happy man. And how do I help your life become more useful and more meaningful? 
by helping you improve your faith, and that's why we're doing it. So we're to do our best to improve our faith. Now, the Bible also says in Proverbs 3, there on your outline, honor God with everything you own, give him the first and best part of everything. If you do this, your barns will fill with grain and your barrels will overflow with wine. Now that's a metaphor, and he's just saying there that if you put God first in your life and you do your best to give him the first of everything in your life, he's gonna bless you back. He's gonna bless you back materially, He's gonna bless you back spiritually. He's gonna bless you back uh, emotionally. And he says, give him the first part. Now when we call giving him the first part of every day, we call that a quiet time. When we talk about giving him the first part of your money, we call that a tithe. When we talk about giving him the first part of your energy or the first part of your thoughts, when we call, talk about giving him the first day of every week, that's called Sunday, church. That's why we give him the first day of every week, because we want him to be first in every area of your life. And whatever you want God to bless, put him first place in. But the Bible says, give him the best. Here's another verse on the screen. Concentrate on doing your best for God. What I want to do this weekend is talk about how do you do that? How, how do I do that? How do I give God my best? Not just give God my leftovers of my time, my energy, my reputation, my thoughts, my talents, whatever, but how do I give God the best of my life? And we're gonna go to a passage in the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter two is a book that Paul wrote to Timothy, who was a pastor in the church at Ephesus. And in that chapter, he uses three illustrations. A soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. And he says these are three metaphors of what it means to live by faith. And he says you can learn a lot about how to give your best to God by looking at an effective soldier, a competitive athlete, and a productive farmer. And he says if you'll follow the models of these three people, you'll understand what it means to live by faith. You'll understand what it means to give your best to God. Okay, let's read the passage. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 to 7 says this. And I want you to circle the three illustration people. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier. Okay, there's the first one, circle soldier. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets tied up in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. And by the way, who's your commanding officer? God. Similarly, uh, if anyone competes as an athlete, circle that, that's the second one, if he competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. And, here's the third illustration, and the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. I mean, he put out the effort, he should be the first to get a share of the crops. And then he says, think about these three illustrations and the Lord will help you to understand how they apply to you. I said in a previous message that the greatest tragedy in life is not death, but a wasted life. And as your pastor, I am committed to helping you be all God wants you to be. I don't want you to settle for second place. I don't want you to settle for uh, also ran. I want you to win the race that God has given to you. I want you to be the best that you can be. And so I want us to look at these three analogies of a soldier and an athlete and a farmer from the Bible. And it starts off, the Bible starts off by saying, look at the military. He says you can learn a lot about faith and about being the best you can be in the military. Do you remember that old army ad, be all you can be in the army? Remember that? And how do I do that? What can we learn from effective soldiers that we would apply to our spiritual life? Well. There's a lot we can learn about being the best from the military. You know, it reminds me of a story. Uh, Admiral Hyman Rickover was the father of America's naval, uh, a nuclear navy, the nuclear subs and, and the nuclear navy, and he was a genius. And I remember reading a story one time that he was re recruiting uh, young graduates from Naval Academy, cadets who had just graduated, to have the privilege of serving on a nuclear submarine. And there was one young man who came in and sat down. He wrote this story later. It became a very famous story. And he said, the Admiral just let me talk for two hours. 
So he said, I talked about anything I wanted to talk about for two hours, and I was really trying to show off all my, my intelligence. And he said, then the Admiral began to ask a series of questions, which slowly dawned on me that I knew nothing about what I just talked about. <laughs> and he said, it was very humbling. And he said, right before I left the two-hour conversation, uh, Admiral Rickover asked me a very poignant question. It was this. When you were in school and in all your previous life up to this date, did you always do your best? And this young man said, well, I started to say, yeah. And then he said, I realized that's not truthful. No. And he said, I thought, no, I, I didn't. And he said, I was honest. I said, no, I didn't do my best all the time. And he said, Admiral Rickover looked at me with piercing eyes and said, why not? And then just sat there. Why not? Why not the best? And he said, that question began to burn in my heart. It began to be the turning point in my life. The man who was that young cadet later became the 39th president of the United States. His name was Jimmy Carter. And when he wrote his biography, it was called, Why Not the Best? And he said, it still haunts me, that question. Am I doing, am I truly giving my best? I mean, truly giving my best. Well, there are three things, if I want to give my best to God, that I must do that every soldier understands. You might write these down. Number one, first I must define what I'd die for. I must define what I'd die for. You say, well, that's a strange place to start on giving your best to God. No, it's not. Because until you know what you're willing to die for, you're not ready to live. You're not ready to live until you know what you'd die for, and you're not ready to love until you know who you'd die for. If you've never clarified what's worth dying for in your life, you really are just not fully alive. Soldiers know there are some things worth dying for. Freedom is worth dying for. Family is worth dying for. Faith is worth dying for. There are some things more valuable even than my own life. And they understand that. And, and even Jesus talks about this and about how that love is best expressed in the willingness to die for somebody else. Look at this verse, John 15, verse 13. Jesus said, the greatest love, the highest form of love, is shown when a person lays down his life for his friends. Now, soldiers understand this. Uh, they, they realize that sometimes it's a matter of life or death, and they put their life on the line uh, practically every day. Jesus says the greatest measure of love is the willingness to sacrifice your life for somebody else. And of course, that's what Jesus did for us. The greatest expression of love is Jesus dying on the cross. You measure love not by what people tell you, not by what, what your boyfriend says to you. You measure love by the willingness to sacrifice. And the greater the sacrifice, the deeper the love. The second thing we learn from soldiers, uh, an effective soldier, is to be the best I can be, I must sacrifice my comfort. I must sacrifice my comfort. And of course, soldiers do this all the time. Think of all the, soldier, the comforts that soldiers give up in, other, in order to serve others. Uh, they give up comfort, they, they go out and they work, serve in the heat and they serve in the cold. Uh, they give up their free schedule because they're not free to do anything they want to do. The commanding officer says, I want you to do this, and I want you to do that. They give up their freedom in order to preserve the freedom of other people. Uh, soldiers give up their wealth. Nobody gets wealthy becoming a soldier. And, and, and so they give up a lot of things. They, they sacrifice their own comfort and the, the, the hardships that they choose to put up with. This is true in, in any area of life. You don't become great without sacrificing. You don't become great by five easy steps. You don't become great. You don't become a great woman. You don't become a great man by doing what's easy, by doing what's comfortable. You become great by committing yourself to something greater than yourself and then being willing to sacrifice for that. And the greater your sacrifice in life, the greater your character in life is. Now the Bible says this in 2 Timothy 2 verse 3. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. 
He's using this metaphor, this analogy of the military, and he says, you need, just like a soldier puts up with in hardship for a greater cause, you need to put up with hardship for a greater cause. What is the hardship in your life? What is following Christ making difficult for you? Well, it could be you're criticized some. That could be a hardship. Ostracized, made fun of, maybe that's a hardship. Any, anytime you do what's right, it's never easy. If doing what's right was easy, everybody would do it. It's much easier to do what's wrong. Always easier to do what's wrong than to do what's right. And that's why it's harder to tell the truth. That's why it's harder to forgive instead of getting even. It's harder to let go instead of getting revenge. It's harder to be kind. It's harder to be unselfish than selfish. These are hardships in following Christ. It's not easy. But the path to greatness and the path to being the best you can possibly be as a man or the best you can possibly be as a woman comes from first defining what you die for and then second, sacrificing your comfort. You see, it's a battle to do what's right. It's not easy. And, and we are in a spiritual battle and nothing, as I mentioned earlier, has ever done great uh, without sacrifice. The Bible says this in Ephesians 5.2. Live a life of sacrificial love just as Christ loved us and gave himself as an offering and a sacrifice for us. So he's saying, okay, if you wanna be like Jesus Christ, and that's the goal, if you wanna be like Jesus Christ, you need to learn sacrificial love because Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice, his own life, and he offered himself as an offering for others. Question, you wanna be like Jesus? Who are you offering your life for? Right now, who are you sacrificing your life for? Who are you putting up with hardships for besides yourself? A lot of people put up with hardships in order to get ahead, in order to succeed for personal goals. Are you involving yourself in any things that are hard to do for the benefit of other people. And sometimes you lose sleep because you're helping other people. And sometimes you spend some of your money because you're helping other people. And sometimes you lose your privacy because you're helping somebody else. These are hardships. I must sacrifice my comfort. If you wanna be like Jesus, we have to live a life of sacrificial love. Now, he says we can learn these things from soldiers. You know, I'm gonna just do this right now. If you served in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, uh, Coast Guard, Reserve, I want you to just stand up right now and let us thank you for your sacrificial service to our country. Would you do that right now? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm gonna do something else. I may get in trouble for this, but I'm the pastor, so I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, we have these little Daring Faith Hero pins that we're giving to people involved in ministry, but if it's okay with all you guys, I wanna give one to everybody who just stood on the way going out, okay? Daring Faith Hero, so, so you know, Tom, if we run out, tell him to order more, okay? Because I just gave them away to these military heroes. God bless you guys. All right. <laughs> you know, I can't think of sacrifice and nothing's great I've ever done without sacrifice without thinking of one of my favorite stories that really touched me as, uh, as a young man, the story of Jim Elliott and, and, and five missionaries. Jim Elliott and four of his best friends heard about a tribe in the deep jungles of the Amazon in Ecuador who had never heard the name of Jesus Christ. Very primitive tribe. No Bible, no believer, no church. And so these five guys said, we're gonna give ourselves to go missionaries to reach this tribe that nobody's ever shared the good news with. And they knew they just couldn't walk in, because it's a pretty violent tribe, and so they started dropping gifts overhead from planes as they'd fly over the jungle, and they were trying to soften them up. And finally, uh, after about six months of preparation, they decided to make first contact with this tribe. And they found a little sand barge on the on the, uh, the river, on the Amazon River, where they could actually land a, a plane, and, and they flew in, and in the first landing, they landed to get out to meet the Indians for the very first time. I wanna, want you to watch this. If you have a child with you, I just want you to know it's a little intense, so you might 
protect them. But watch this, watch what happened. Missionaries! What? <laughs> Mira Java! Mira Java! When those five missionaries were martyred in their very first attempt to share the good news with those Indians, the world was rocked. It was on the cover of every magazine. And many people said, what a waste. What a waste. Those people went to tell them the good news and they didn't even get to share it. And they gave their lives. But that wasn't the end of the story. In the closing words, when Jim Elliott looks up at Minkayani, the tribal chief who was killing him at that moment and offers words of forgiveness, something sticks in his heart and he begins to soften. And the rest of the story is, is that some of the wives of those missionaries said, we're gonna go in now. And Elizabeth Elliot, Jim Elliot's wife, took her young daughter and Rachel Saint, a sister of one of the other missionaries, those brave, courageous, daring faith women moved to that tribe and moved in with them. And they began to share the good news and the people were so shocked that the wives would come after they'd killed the husbands. And they began to share the good news and the, the, the tribe converted to Christ. Minkayani, that man who was the, the leader and who killed Jim Elliot, he later had Nate Saint, who was the son of one of the men killed, went, came and lived in him, and Nate Saint adopted him as his father, the man who killed his own dad. Minkayani became a devout Christian, and then became a preacher, and began to travel the world, telling people about the good news of forgiveness. And in 2006, that Indian, Minkayani, stood on the stage of Saddleback Church, and preached to this crowd, gave me these beads to represent, their peace beads, to represent the effect of the peace plan around the world. And we, they found the old plane that had laid buried in that sandbar, they took it apart, they brought it, and we put it here on the stage, on the anniversary of that, the death of those men. In fact, I think we've got a picture of, the, yeah, there's Minkayani, there's Pastor Tom at a much younger age, and, uh, and there's Minkayani just beaming with the love of Jesus Christ, no longer a hater, no longer filled with rage and jealousy, but a lover 
and, and a, a preacher of the good news of the gospel. How did that man come to Christ? Because somebody was willing to sacrifice. There are some things worth dying for. Now I doubt that you will be asked to give your life for Jesus Christ, but would you be willing? Or are you just a casual Christian, not a committed Christian? And are you willing to sacrifice your own comfort for the greater good of other people? That's what it means to be like Jesus. There's one other thing. Third thing we learn from a soldier is that I must eliminate distractions if I wanna be the best that I could possibly be. If I wanna be the best man I can be, if I wanna be the best woman I can be, I've gotta eliminate distractions. And the next verse in this passage says this. As Christ's soldier, do not let yourself become entangled in the affairs of this life, wasting time, for then you can't please your commanding officer who enlisted you into his army. If there's one thing a soldier must have is he must have the freedom to respond with flexibility when his commanding officer says, go. No, off, no, no soldier can say, sorry, I'm busy right now. I'm watching say yes to the dress. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm busy. I, I can't go serve right now. I, I've got my, I'm going out for a game of golf right now. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't help because I'm, I'm, I'm going to play my hobby and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go read this, I'm going to go watch a game. And No, no. Soldiers say they can't get affair, uh, involved in the affairs of this life and civilian life because they have to be ready in a moment's notice to do what their commanding officer tells them to do. You have to eliminate distractions. Now the Bible has a lot to say about doing without things that really don't matter. How much of your time is invested in things that aren't gonna matter five years from today, much less in eternity? How much of your energy is invested in things that aren't gonna matter five years from today, much less for eternity? How much of your money are you investing in things that aren't gonna matter five years from today, much less for eternity. If you want to be great, if you want to be the best, you must start spending more of your time, more of your money, and more of your energy on things that are gonna last forever, and less of on it on things that don't really matter. I mean, do you really need to know how many times a Hollywood celebrity's been married? Is that the most important thing you need to fill your mind with? No then why are you reading all of those magazines about those stories of people you don't even care about? It's a waste of time, it's a waste of brain space. What could you give up? I wanna challenge you to think about this week. What could you give up? An hour of TV a week? What could you give up in order to make more time for the things that matter in life? To love, to serve, to know God, to worship. These are the things we learn from effective soldiers. Define what I can die for, sacrifice my comfort, and eliminate distractions. Next, Paul moves to the second example, second metaphor. And he says, you know what? Uh, you can learn some things from sports, too. If you really want to learn, you can learn some things for your spiritual life from sports. And he says, let's look at the serious athlete, the competitive athlete. Not the casual one, but, but the serious one. And the second most used analogy for the Christian life in the Bible is an athlete. And the Bible compares your life to a race. You are running a race in life. And it's not a 50 yard dash, it's a marathon. And my job as your pastor is to help you get across the finish line. Because you're in a race. And I don't want you to get sidelined, I don't want you to get run off in the ditch, I want you to make it to the finish line and win the prize. And here's what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. In a race, everyone runs. In other words, everybody in life is living their life. But only one person wins the prize. So, run your race to win. Run your race to win. To win the contest, you must deny yourselves many things that would keep you from doing your best. There's that phrase again. An athlete goes to all this trouble just to win a ribbon or a medal that won't last. But we do it for an eternal reward that will last forever. So, I run straight toward the goal with purpose in every step. I fight to win. I'm not just shadow boxing or playing around. Like an athlete, I discipline my body, I discipline myself, making sacrifices 
and training my body to do what it should, not what it wants to do. Otherwise, I fear that I might be disqualified from the race. Now, just like the soldier has three things to teach us, the athlete has three things to teach us about being the best we can be. You might write these down. The first thing we learn from the athlete is this, I must intend to win. If I'm gonna win in life, it's gotta be intentional. It's not gonna happen by accident. It's not gonna happen without effort. It's not gonna happen unless I have a goal. You will not become great by accident. You will not become the best woman you could possibly be or the best man you could possibly be just casually. It'll only happen if you intend to become the best you can be, if you intend to have a great soul, intend to have a goal. This is the difference between being a casual Christian and a competitive or a committed Christian. Is there a difference between a competitive golfer and a casual golfer? Oh yeah. The casual, the, the committed golfer takes it serious. They're, they're playing to win and they're very, they get stressed out about it if they don't win. If you're a casual golfer, you're just hitting the ball around, you're having fun, smelling the roses, you know, looking at the gophers, you know, you're just looking for some time off. The difference is the degree of seriousness. Question, how serious are you about being what God made you to be? Well, I kind of like to do it in my spare time. It isn't gonna happen. How serious are you about being the best you could possibly be? The Bible said there in verse 24, in a race, everyone runs, but only one person wins the prize. So run your race to win. Circle that, run your race to win. You should be living your life in a way that you're running to win. God wants you to win. God doesn't want you to be a loser. God wants you to be a winner. He wants you to run the race to win, and you've gotta do this intentionally. Now the truth is, there's some people that are listening to me right now, that you're never gonna be a great person. You're never gonna be the person God intended. You're never gonna be the best man or the best woman you can be. Why? Because you never intended to be. You're not willing to pay the price. You're just not willing to pay the price. You, you, you don't want it badly enough. You, you, you don't want it deeply enough. How deeply do you want to win the prize that God has for you in life? You say, well, what's the prize? Look at the next verse. Greater reward, reward and responsibility in eternity. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 12, run your best. Run your best in the race of faith. And that's what we're talking about, daring faith. And win eternal life. That's what you win, eternal life for yourself. For this is the life that God called you to when you professed your faith before many witnesses. What does it mean when you professed your faith before many witnesses? I was talking about your baptism. When you're baptized, you are professing your faith in front of many witnesses. If you haven't been baptized, that's what you need to do next. You need to profess your faith in front of many witnesses. Baptism is the way you do that. Then he says there, he says, you need to run your best race. You need to do it intentionally. He said, God, I, I, I really goofed off in a lot of my earlier life, but I want the rest of my life to be the best of my life. I wanna make it count. I wanna make up for lost time. And I'm serious about this. I'm not gonna be a casual Christian. I'm serious about this. I want your best for my life. Now, to be the best I can be for God, first I have to do it intentionally. I have to make the choice to go after it. Second, I must discipline myself. And of course, this is what athletes do. No athlete becomes a pro athlete without discipline, without training. You don't become great by doing whatever you feel. You don't become great by living by your moods. You just can't make up your own rules. You can't, there are no shortcuts to maturity, there's no shortcuts to greatness. Look at a couple of verses. Verse five says this, if anyone competes as an athlete, he cannot receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. And in 1 Corinthians 9, 25, 27, to win the contest, you must deny yourself many things that would keep you from doing your best. An athlete goes into strict training just to win a ribbon or a medal that won't last, but we do it for an eternal reward that will last forever. So, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Now we all know stories of what Olympian athletes give up in order to win a gold medal. 
they pretty much put their life on hold. They put, all, they put their social life on hold. They have a, r a rigid schedule of when I get up in the morning, when I go to bed at night. They have a rigid schedule of the training table, what they eat, what they won't eat, what they do, what they don't do. They give up, they make enormous sacrifices to win a gold or silver or a bronze. And God says, you know what? Nobody's even gonna remember those rewards. And they gave their whole life. They gave their whole life to something that's just gonna vanish. It's not gonna last. But he says, it is a wise move to do that for something that's gonna last forever in eternity. And to make your life count and say, well, okay, there's some things I can do without so I can spend more time with God, so I can give more to God, so I could serve more, so I could be more in what God wants me to be. I would again ask you this question. What am I willing to do without in order to be the best? Am I willing to do without popularity? Am I willing to do without wealth? Am I willing to do with, without comfort? I saw a poster yesterday and it said this, the pain of regret is always greater than the pain of discipline. That's a pretty profound statement. The pain of regret is always greater than the pain of discipline. How would your life be better if you had been just a little bit more disciplined early on in your life? What are some things you could be enjoying today if you had been more disciplined in earlier life? The pain of regret goes on and on and on. I never learned that language, and I wanted to, but I didn't. I never did this, I never did. It is takes discipline. What do you wish you'd been more disciplined about? I would say, start now. You say, well Rick, how do I be more disciplined? I, I try for a while and then I give up. It's because you're depending on your power, not God's power. Willpower doesn't work. Let me just be real honest about it. Willpower doesn't work. It'll work for about 90 days. You can change anything in your life for about 90 days. That's why almost 100% of New Year's resolutions are over by March. Because you could force yourself to do something, anything, for about 90 days. And then you're gonna give up. You don't need willpower, you need God's power. And how do you get God's power? By focusing on his reward. Notice the secret to personal discipline is in that verse. It's right there. He says, we do it for an eternal reward. And that leads us to the third key we learn from athletes. Write this down. To be the best I can be for God, I must stay focused on the reward. I must stay focused on the reward. What's the payoff of doing right? What's the payoff of doing good? What's the payoff of serving Jesus Christ? Just rewards for out eternity. That's no little ribbon or pin you're gonna get in this life. I have to remember the result, the prize, the payoff, the reward. By the way, did you know this is what caused Jesus to be able to endure the cross? How was Jesus able to put up with all the beating, the suffering, the punishment, the torture, all of the evil and the mean things they did to him before he went to the cross and then nailed him to the cross? How did he put up with all that suffering? The Bible says he looked beyond the pain to the reward that he was gonna receive and the benefit and the prize and the payoff. The Bible says this, look up here on the screen, Hebrews 12, keep your eyes on Jesus who both began and finished this race we're in. You're in a race whether you realize it or not. It's the race of life. Study how he did it. Because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That joyful finish with God in heaven. He could put up with anything along the way. The cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. You can handle enormous pain in your life and you can handle enormous discipline in your life if you realize there's a better purpose for it and there's gonna be a payoff at the end. When you forget the payoff, when you forget the reward, when you forget the prize, then you're gonna give up. And that's why Paul says run to win in your life and keep your eye on the prize. Know what God's doing. Can you imagine yourself in heaven receiving the prize of God, the well done, the commendation, and the promotion and the, or the, uh, the rewards that God's gonna give you, let that motivate you. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians 9, 26. 
I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. He's purpose driven. All right, I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. I fight to win. I'm not just shadow boxing. I'm not just playing around. The problem with a lot of people today, they're just shadow boxing. They're air guitaring their Christian life. They're pretending. They're just playing around. They're just hitting the air. They're not serious. And he says, run straight to the goal. You need to stay focused on the finish line. You need to stay focused on this fact. Everything you see is one day gonna be gone. So you shouldn't be investing a lot of time and money and energy in it. You should be primarily investing your time in things that are gonna last forever. What's that? Love, the word of God, and people. Those are gonna last forever. Everything else isn't gonna last. And so you ignore the crowds. And if people cheer you or people jeer you, you just ignore them. You're running the race. You keep your eye on the goal and you don't waste energy. How many things did I do this last week, wasting energy on things that really don't matter? How many things did I worry about this week that really doesn't matter in the long scheme of things? I need to be more focused, more purpose driven, like the competitive athlete. Then finally, we come to the third metaphor, and he says, you know, uh, you can learn from agriculture. You can learn from farmers some truths about your spiritual life. And here's what the Bible says about that. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 14. Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each make up your mind as to how much you should give. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves the person who gives cheerfully. Then if I give not out of pressure or reluctance but cheerfully, then God will generously provide all you need. This is a promise. And you will always have everything that you need and plenty left over to share with others. For God is the one who gives seed to the farmer. And then he gives the farmer bread to eat. And in the same way, just like he does with the farmer, he will give you many opportunities to do good and he will produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched so that you can give even more generously. And you will be glorifying God through your generous gifts. And your generosity will prove that you are obedient to the good news of, of Christ. Now, I could spend a, a week on this text, but let me just summarize it. Your life on earth is like planting a garden. That's what he's saying here. He's saying that while you're here on earth, you got 60, 80, maybe 90, at the most 100 years. While you're here, you're planting a garden. And the kind of seeds that you plant while you're here on earth, you're gonna harvest in heaven. What you sow on earth, you will reap in heaven. What you plant on earth will be the fruit that you get to enjoy for eternity in heaven. And he said if you plant generously, if you plant a lot of seeds, you're gonna have a lot of fruit in heaven. You're gonna have a lot to joy there. But he says if you plant sparingly, you're a miser, and you hold it back, and you don't give it away, he said, you're not gonna have much up there. He says if you sow generously, you're gonna reap generously. Now five times in the Bible, Jesus gives the same command. And he says this, I tell you, store up treasure for yourself in heaven. 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 Anytime God says something five times, he's saying, I really want you to get this. I highly recommend you store up treasure in heaven. Are you doing that? You say, well, how in the world do I do that? By planting seeds of generosity. Anytime you plant a seed of generosity, I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about what you give of your life away. You're planting a seed of generosity. When you help somebody else, when you are unselfish, when you serve, when you put yourself out for the benefit of somebody else, when you do something totally unselfish, when you are generous with your time, when you are generous with your money and your income, when you are generous with your reputation, when you're generous with your talent, and you use it for the benefit of others, not yourself, you are planting seeds. 
and he says, I highly recommend that you sow generously because you want a lot of fruit in heaven. You want a lot there. Here's the final lesson, write this down. To reap a great harvest, I must plant generously in faith. I must plant generously in faith. Kay and I have done this hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. You know our story. You know that Kay and I give away 91% of our income and we live on nine. And uh, we raise that from 10% every year for 40 years. And, and uh, you cannot outgive God. I'll, I just give you a clear example. I played this game for 40 years with God. I lose every year. You cannot outgive God. Let me end with, with two promises of Jesus. Luke chapter six says this. Give and it will be given back to you. You'll be given much. It will be poured into your hands, more than you can hold. You will be given so much, it will spill out on your lap. The way you give to others is the way God will give to you. Underline that verse. The way you give to others is the way God will give to you. I highly recommend you start being generous in planting seeds in this life to har harvest in the next. And then in Mark chapter 10, verse 29, 31, Jesus gives a guarantee about anything you give up for his sake. Mark 10, 29, 31, Jesus says this, I guarantee you this. Now, if God guarantees something, you can count on that one, okay? I guarantee you this, anyone who gives up anything for my sake and for the good news, just like those people who gave up time and money and energy and all of those different campaigns. Anyone who gives up anything for my sake and the good news, whether it's a home or a family member or property, will get more than that back. This is a guarantee of Jesus. Multiplied a hundredfold. And, he says, in this world to come, in the world to come, they will be given eternal life forever. Now, God says, anything that I give up for his sake, for his kingdom, anything I sacrifice for him, I'll be returned a hundredfold. Do you know what a hundredfold is? That's 10,000% interest. Do you know any stockbroker who will guarantee that? Do you know anybody who will guarantee you 10,000% interest on your return? No, you do not. Only God and sons can do that. They've been doing business with people like you for 2,000 years. That is the promise of God. Now, you can either believe it or you don't. But if you don't believe it, why do you believe Jesus will save you and get, take you to heaven? That's the same Jesus. Why do some people trust God with their eternal salvation and don't trust God with their finances? That does not make sense. It doesn't make sense. So, when we look at these three people, the soldier, the effective soldier, saves lives. The effective athlete wins the prize. And the effective farmer harvests a larger size, a hundredfold. Now, as I close, in this message I've asked you a couple times to consider what is it that I might give up or let go of in order to have more time for the things that matter in life? What is it that I could let go of in order to give more, to serve more, to share more, to be more, to be all God wants to be, in order to be the best you can be. Now the fact is, there are a lot of things in your life you could probably do without, and, and you wouldn't miss them. A lot of things. But there is one thing you cannot do without. You gotta have this one. What you cannot do without is a daily, deep connection with Jesus Christ. If you're gonna grow and become the man God wants you to be. If you're gonna grow and become the woman God wants you to be, you have to have a daily deep connection with Jesus Christ. You can't live a day without him. Because these things that we just talked about, these seven things, three from the soldier, three from the farmer, and one from the, I mean, three from the athlete, and one from the farmer, these seven things, you can't do them on your own. You can't do them on willpower. You'll do them for a while and you'll give up. You need God's power. You need to be plugged into him. And that's what it takes. Would you pray this prayer? Uh, dear God, I have to admit that I have not always used my time for things that really matter. And I have wasted 
energy and money on things that aren't gonna last. But I want that to change. I wanna run my race to win. I wanna win the prize. I wanna reap the harvest. I wanna please my commanding officer, you. And Lord, if that means sacrificing my comfort, so be it. If that means and involves eliminating distractions, so be it. If that means even being willing to, to die for you, so be it. I intend to win. I want the rest of my life to be the best of my life. And God, I know I can't change on my own. I don't have enough willpower. I need your power to discipline myself, to go for the best, to stay focused on the reward. I'm asking you to teach me to plant generously so I can harvest abundantly in the next life. Help me to not be short thinking. Help me not to think of only the here and now, which is not gonna last, but to live my life the way you intended me to in light of eternity, and to do now what I will later enjoy for eternity. If you've never invited Jesus Christ in your life, say, Jesus Christ, come into my life and save me right now. I want to know you, I want to trust you, and I want to learn to love you. I give you myself completely, and I ask you to use me for your purposes. In your name I pray, amen.